Up next, I want to introduce Dana Syracuse from Perkins Cooey. Perkins Cooey has been another very strong legal partner of the Chamber of Digital Commerce. Um, we invited Dax Hansen, who's a partner there, to serve as the chair of our state working group. And the team at Perkins has been incredibly helpful in terms of supporting um, this group and the work we're doing with the states. Um, as you all may know, uh, the states need a lot of help when it comes to blockchain technology. Um, there's a lot of expertise, well, there's not a lot of expertise on the federal level, um, and to expect every single state to also have that expertise has been incredibly challenging. And we've had a lot of states that have reached out to us to be um, a resource, as you heard Jeremy Kaufman from Library um, give his testimony um, in um, for New Hampshire. And Perkins has been with us um, every step of the way in that process. Um, and Dana um, plays a key role um, in the state working group um, and the work that we're doing. And Dana has actually led um, some of the chamber's efforts, and I'll name out a couple of the stakeholders he's been involved with, including the state of Illinois, uh, the Uniform Law Commission, and the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, which is really stirring things up. So um, next, I want to welcome um, Dana Syracuse for a legal briefing. Thanks, Dana. Thank you. <laughs> so, oh, the microphone's on. So my name is Dana Syracuse. I'm with Perkins Cooey. Uh, my background is as a regulator. Um, prior to being with Perkins, I was associate general counsel at the New York State Department of Financial Services, uh, where I was uh, one of the drafters of the BIT license, um, helped oversee the chartering of ITBIT and Gemini Trust companies, and helped oversee kind of the uh, fintech process over at DFS. And indeed, my first exposure to the chamber was, was as a regulator uh, when the chamber came in to, to advocate on behalf of, of the industry uh, in, that, in that drafting process. Uh, just turning, turning to the first slide. So, you know, I think that it's been a, a tremendously exciting and productive year on the state and federal level. Um, I think that the states are finally seeing uh, the need to, to be active. And as we'll go through in the presentation today, um, indeed, the, 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 the federal side has also been, been tremendously active with the SEC, the CFTC, the OCC, uh, all attempting to stake a claim. Um, but you know, in terms of, of trends and use cases, um, you know, digital, pay, digital assets, payments, remittances, smart contracts, you know, th those are areas where I think the, the regulatory framework is solid or solidifying. It's in the blockchain 2.0 and blockchain 3.0 applications where I think that there's still a tremendous uh, amount of work that needs to be done in terms of educating regulators, both um, as to you know, existing laws and regulations that could apply uh, and potentially ones that should be put into effect to, to help um, foster, foster the technology. And you know, these technologies, they, they, they cut across uh, all industries. And because of the way the law is, is currently constructed, you could have uh, industries putting together um, you know, applications where you're, you're tokenizing assets. But because of the way it's done, we'll talk about it later, but because of the way it's done, uh, you wind up getting absorbed into either securities issues or commodities issues or state regulatory issues. But this, this I think, is a, is, a, is a very important slide. And here you see, starting in uh, October 2008, that was when the Satoshi white paper was, was initially published. And then you had the first blockchain use case, which was, which was Bitcoin. And really nothing happened on the regulatory front, or very little happened, uh, until March 2013, when FinCEN put out its initial guidance uh, stating that exchangers, uh, transmitters, and custodians needed to, regulate, need, needed to uh, register as money service businesses. Then, uh, about a year later, the IRS put out uh, guidance stating that virtual currency should be treated as property for federal tax purposes. Well, that's interesting because you have the FinCEN looking at it as money and you have the IRS looking at it as property. 
Then uh, about a year later, uh, you had the first um, piece of uh, the first virtual currency regulation in the country, the bit license. Uh, the Conference of State Banking Supervisors followed along soon after. Uh, and not a lot happened in, in that period. I think you had, you had states and the federal government that were trying to get their arms around, uh, around the issues. Um, but then I think it was this past year where things started to get interesting uh, with the OCC's initial uh, white paper supporting responsible innovation. That was when we first got the sense that it was possible that the OCC was going to start regulating fintech companies. We didn't know what that meant. Um, you know, there was a hope that that would be uh, a 50 state fix, meaning that certain types of companies that would be regulated on a 50 state level uh, wouldn't have to go and, and do that. They could get one license nationwide. Uh, and the OCC has continued with that process following through to even yesterday where they put out a draft, um, uh, a, a proposed draft uh, stating kind of the criteria that they look for in licensing fintech companies. That's open for comment right now. The comment period on that closes uh, 30 days from now. North Carolina amended its Money Transmitters Act to regulate um, consumer wallets. The SEC held a fintech uh, forum where they, at, and, and where they stated that they felt they were best suited to regulate fintech companies. Uh, Illinois has clarified their money transmitter law to say, say that Bitcoin uh, and just pure crypto activity is not covered. Um, and it, it goes on and on. And you see even just in the past couple of months, uh, New Hampshire has a bill that may be signed by the governor exempting digital currency activity. Uh, North Dakota uh, is looking into virtual currency activity. Washington State um, is likely to amend its uh, Uniform Money Services Act to include virtual currency. Georgia's been active. Uh, and maybe perhaps sometime in July, the Uniform Law Commission will put out a piece of uniform legislation that could be enacted by all the states um, that would set forth a, a uniform criteria. Uh, discussed that. Um, so these are the, but right now, these are the only four states that have taken concrete steps uh, to deal specifically with digital currency. So what that means is if you're a digital currency company and you're trying to go nationwide, you need to go and then analyze each individual state statute or, or, or regulation. And they generally fall into, a, into two different categories. One category, uh, is the state, does the state money transmission law only cover money? Another category would be, uh, does it cover monetary value? Well, for the ones that cover monetary value, you have a possibility that it's going to govern pure crypto activity. Um, uh, uh, rather, rather not, not cover pure, pure crypto activity. So if you, look at the, if you look at the states, on balance, about half the states uh, would cover uh, crypto to crypto activity and crypto walleting services, about half the states would not. But if you don't do that analysis, you run the risk of engaging in unlicensed money transmission. International activity, it's definitely been quite active. Uh, People's Bank of China is, is conducting inspections uh, of exchanges there. Um, I'll just let, let everyone read this, don't have to go through it in detail. But the point is on the international front, we're also seeing increased activity. And I think a lot of that is a result of the excitement over blockchain, uh, the potential for uh, nations such as India to move to a completely uh, cashless system, uh, and an overall, in, 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 an overall embracement of it. So. As I mentioned earlier, the SEC had a, fin had a fintech forum in October uh, where they said that they could be the premier regulator for fintech companies. Um, but what have they actually done in, in the past year? Well, one place where uh, crypto companies wind up interacting with, with the OCC um, is when they're doing things like ICOs, which require an analysis of, are you acting as a security? And that winds up being a three-part test under Howey. Is there a reasonable ex expectation of profits? Uh, are you engaging in a common enterprise? And is the activity derived mainly from the efforts of others? Um, which you know, winds up being a, a, a quite complex analysis. The other place where they've been very active over the course 
uh, of the past year is um, in ETFs. Right now, there are three. Uh, there, there were three applications. One has been denied. Um, it was an application by the Winklevoss uh, Bitcoin Trust to get listed on the on the Bats Exchange. Now, the denial was not. It didn't go to the substance of the application, but rather an overall concern. Um, that many exchanges, the wider spot exchange market remains unregulated. Uh, and for that reason, the batch exchange wouldn't be able to enter into the necessary surveillance sharing agreements that would allow them a, a, allow, a, allow proper supervision. Um, and really what this harkens back is the, the notion of like, where are we in um, the progress of the ecosystem? Where does more regulation need to be need? Uh, where's more regulation needed? Um, and where is advocacy needed? And that's where, you know, that's where the chamber comes in. That's where um, industry that wants to actively uh, interact with regulators, that, that's where it becomes very important because I think a lot of regulators, there, there is a political fear where they don't want to stick their neck out. They don't want to be, um, they don't want to be the one on the chopping block. I think that you know, people saw a criticism uh, against New York with the, with the bit license, um, and they don't want to engage in that political risk. But the more you have a dialogue between the community um, and regulators, I think it creates for a, a far healthier uh, ecosystem. And that's kind of what the OCC is trying to do. Uh, the OCC is, has started their fintech uh, innovation process, and one key step that they've taken is opening up the Office of Innovation. That opened in October, uh, and it's going to have three offices, New York, D.C., and San Francisco. And what they are encouraging is for uh, industry, to the extent you're not going to apply for a fintech charter, but to come in and interact. I think a lot of those companies coming in and interacting could potentially be deemed third-party vendors and captured under the OCC third-party vendor regs. So it's a communication that could happen. It's a communication that is useful, but it's one that I think industry uh, needs to be careful about. So the process with the OCC is not yet complete. Um, as I said, the OCC is still accepting comments on the current white paper. But one thing that they did do is they, they digested the comments that were received in response to the December white paper. And there were a couple, uh, the, the community got some important feedback there. One is um, the notion that the OCC is not going to take uh, the step of going for light touch regulation. So one of the points that was requested was, well, fintech companies, they're new, they're young, they should be subject to some sort of lighter supervision, lighter capitalization, et cetera. The OCC said that that won't be the case because you will be receiving a bank charter. That's essentially what they said. Um, I think it's still an important point for the community to push back on a, a little bit because the notion that uh, you know they want to regulate fintech companies, that's great. Um, fintech companies, by the way, they're engaged in one of the three core banking functions. Um, but I think that the applicant pool may be less if they're going in and going to be subject to um, you know high capitalization and high supervision. The CFTC, um, I've only got a couple minutes left, uh, but they have also been quite active. Uh, there was an enforcement action against Bitfinex um, earlier this year where the uh, criticism was uh, if you have a exchange that's engaged in leverage or margin or finance trading, that can fall under the, under the, uh, under the CEA. Um, they had previously said that they viewed Bitcoin uh, as a commodity. So it's very clear that if you're engaged in this type of activity, you must register with the CFTC. But the question is, um, can you actually show actual delivery uh, with Bitcoin and the, OC, the, the, the CFTC hasn't really come out with a clear statement on how that it can occur. Um, I think that over the course of the next year as leadership solidifies at the CFTC, as it solidifies at uh, the SEC and we'll see what happens when a new comptroller comes in over the OCC, what their policies are going to be. But clearly the trend is um, forward. Clearly the trend is seeing the importance of FinTech seeing the importance of blockchain, seeing the importance of digital assets on our capital markets, uh, and a, um, an overall desire to, to, to play a role. And I think that as the federal government acts more, you're going to see more activity out of the states. You're going to see the states realize that if they 
don't up their game, um, they will lose their role as, you know, as a prudential regulator. So I think the overall story is one of forward momentum. The overall story is um, one that I think is positive uh, for everyone in this room. Thank you.